Good evening. Um, actually, if you will, grab your Bibles and turn to uh, Mark chapter 6. <clears throat> Mark chapter 6 tonight. Um, before we, uh, we dive into um, what we're going to study tonight, I, um, I was given this, um, this little book here um, by a friend of mine. We um, um, was talking the other day, and he, he, he gave me this, and, and I've just been trying to read it as... Um, what little time I have to, to throw another book into um, what I have going on, but I, I've been trying to, to read this um, this book, and it's uh, it's called um, Power Through Prayer by E.M. Bounds. Um, and, and the gist of the book, I've, I've read of just a few chapters so far, but, um, you know, really the gist of the book is um, that a, a man without prayer, especially being a, a preacher, is is not a powerful man a powerful person that the power of of the preacher is what uh he does um in prayer um and that's what radiates out and, and he even one of the chapters i just got finished reading he was talking about that that the the letter that kills and he says you know the the, the words uh, of the sermon can be life if the preacher is is in Gulfed in prayer and seeking God and being empowered by God, or his sermon can be death uh, because it's not speaking the true life of God's word because it's not bound in prayer. But anyway, um, there was there was a few statements that this guy made, and I just thought it was just just appropriate for us, and I was going to read it just real quickly um, before we kind of dive in tonight. Um, but th but this is what he said. He's he's talking about once again just talking about preaching and. And talking about um, the church and prayer. And he says, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Spirit can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. Uh, and there's one other statement, too, that he made that I thought was very... Um, he said, it is not great talents, nor great learning, nor great preachers that God needs, but men great in holiness, great in faith, great in love, great in fidelity, great for God. Men always preaching by holy sermons in, in the pulpit, by holy lives out of it. These can mold a generation for God. Um, just, a, just a powerful book that, um, small but mighty, um, but just um, some powerful words of, of, you know, God calling us. And, and I know sometimes we get focused on, um, uh, I guess, what we seem to be Consider the bigger things of ministry or the bigger things of of our Christian walk, but you know it's it always comes back to really the basic things um, of of prayer and and seeking God through His Word uh, and fellowship with other believers that really shapes and molds um, the men and women of God um, to be um, what God desires and to be the light in this world that God desires uh, for the church to be. And um, that's some things that we oftentimes say for granted. I know I do, and I'm speaking to myself here. I know that oftentimes I do, and this, this book has really challenged me to um, to want to be more fervent in, in prayer and to know that's where our spiritual lives are fed and the spiritual lives are built um, is in those quiet times. Um, you know, um, I'm going to say this and we'll move on, but anyway, you know, you always... You know, think about these great athletes. I, you know, I was always uh, amused by Michael Jordan. I was, you know, I grew up in that era. You know, when Michael Jordan was just a man. You know, and, and nobody, um, in my eyes, he's he, he's the goat. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, but you know, and you look at how easy he made things look, but then you never think about the behind the scenes of how much work he put in to being the greatest basketball player to ever play. And um, I remember there's a poster I remember seeing. And he taught, and on the poster he said, you know, about all the shots that, you know, being cut from the basketball team, all the shots that he, the last second shots that he missed, you know, and all the times the ball's been put in his hand and he didn't make the shot. But, you know, I think at the end he says, you know, but I always was ready to take it or whatever it was. I can't remember exactly, but, you know, um, and it's the same way in our Christian life. We fail, 
Um, we struggle, um, but you know, it's behind the scenes that a lot of times the people don't understand what we as Christians are seeking after and the, 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 the things we go through, you know, um, the, the struggles, the, the battles we go through in our, in our personal lives, in our quiet time, um, that help us when we're out there and people seeing the, the better side of us, I guess you could say, for lack of better terms. Um, but, you know, and I think sometimes people need to know um, the struggles uh, that it is in, in the Christian walk and not say that it's just this. I think that's where the church can get sidetracked at times. But anyway, I just um, wanted to share that tonight. Um, we, are, we are looking at the, the last little portion of chapter 6. And I want to do something um, tonight, um, maybe a little bit differently. Um, th this passage tonight is is very brief. Um, it's it's really not a whole lot to it, honestly. Um, it's really more of a summary, and it's really somewhat of a transition um, from uh, from one section of Mark's gospel to another section that Mark is going to go into. Now, we're, we're getting almost to the middle point of Mark's gospel in, in Mark chapter 8, when we come to that confession of Peter, um, is kind of the, 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 the turning point in Mark's gospel. And this is, this is what we're kind of leading up to. And we kind of seen some of that last week when we, we, we seen kind of the end of what took place last week in, in, our, in our discussion. Um, but let's read this passage. And then what I want to do is I, I kind of feel like tonight... Maybe just, I know we share a lot of information whenever we're preaching a sermon. I know I give a lot of information um, from, from things I've read on it or, or things that, you know, I feel like God has, has just what I see that God is, is doing in the passage. Um, so I, I kind of want to maybe give us a little review from, from this, for this section and lead us up to this where we are now and kind of, give this summary of the passage we are and this will kind of prepare us for where we will be at um the next time we meet when we go into um more of a teaching session of what jesus is teaching begins to teach in chapter seven and um, um throughout that that particular chapter so this is once again um connected this passage in the beginning of verse 53 is connected to the passage previous to that, and that's the, the walking, uh, Jesus walking on the water, because he picks up in verse 53 and says, and when they crossed over, do you remember, and, and we'll explain this a little bit more in just a few minutes, but you remember they were, they were in the boat, uh, and Jesus came to them on the sea, walking on the water. So it says here, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of the, uh, the Garen Sea, uh, Gennesaret, uh, and moored to the shore, and when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countrysides, and they laid the sick in the marketplace places and implored him that he might that they might touch even the fringe of his garments. And as many as touched it, or may well. So this is really another another summary passage that Mark gives in his gospel. Uh, Mark has given two uh, summary passages already in his gospel. If you if you turn to Mark chapter one uh, in verses thirty two, um, it says, and then the evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and or oppressed by demons. The whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, but they knew him. And that's the first one. And then in John, uh, in Mark chapter 3, verse 7, this is another somewhat summary passage there. It says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and the great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and in the Mia, uh, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon, uh, when the great crowd heard all that was doing, they came to him and they told his disciples to have a boat, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. 
and he had healed many so that who so all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him and who and whenever the unclean spirits saw him they fell down before him and cried out you are the son of god and he strictly ordered them not to make him known so we see these two passages of scripture and we kind of see mark kind of giving this all inclusive statements about Jesus's ministry and Jesus's healing that he doesn't he's not very specific in saying this individual person like we're dealing with the paralytic man or or Peter's mother-in-law but there's this kind of all-inclusive and every one of these summary passages including this one tonight um, deal with the crowd of people who are sick who are coming to Jesus and all of them are dealing with Jesus's popularity um, this is probably the height of Jesus' ministry at this point in which we are at now in Mark chapter 6. People are flooding to him. People are desiring to, to be healed by him. They're desiring to, to touch his garment, to, to uh, just to simply get close to him to be able to be healed, um, to be fed by him, to see the miracles, or, or to some maybe genuinely wanting to hear the teaching that Jesus had taught or was teaching them. And so Jesus was traveling all around this area of Galilee, and he's been making this imprint in this area um, where people know who Jesus is. Now, this section here that we're looking at tonight, it, it transitions us into another teaching session of Jesus, as I stated earlier. If you remember, the first teaching section that Jesus does uh, in Mark's gospel is back in Mark chapter 4. Um, in Mark chapter 4, if you remember, uh, Jesus had been traveling, uh, he'd been healing people, and then we come to chapter 4, and he starts, to, he begins to teach in parables, and he begins to give us these parables of Jesus, and and <clears throat> he taught the parable of the souls, uh, or the sower, which is in, in 4, 1 through 9, uh, and then he gives us the explanation in verses 10 through 20, and he, he talked about how uh, the four souls and, and how the gospel is being preached and what the response is to the gospel. Um, in the parable of the uh, lamp uh, in Mark 4, 21 through 25, he's talking about the, the lamp not being put under a basket. Uh, in uh, verses 26 through 29, he talks about the growing seed and the mustard seed in verses 30 and 34. Now, after these, these teaching sessions, Jesus begins to, to travel. What seems to be a lot in this area are the section by boat. It's kind of the, the boat scenes of Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of traveling back and forth across this, this Sea of Galilee. Now, now I haven't been, Miss Frankie has been, and it's not a very big area. They call it a sea, but it's not really not really a sea, more like a big lake, uh, I think would probably be the better explanation for it. Um, but they're traveling across this body of water constantly um, is how Jesus is traveling. And, and his disciples are seeing these amazing things that are taking place with Jesus and taking place around them. And, and the thing that, that's being emphasized from chapter five or really at the end of chapter four really whenever this section begins so so what i'm trying to say here is is that chapter four is a teaching session that jesus has and then he begins to go into this miracles beginning in verse 35 of chapter four and there's this kind of this period of miracles that we've been looking at over the past several weeks and now we're about to get back into this kind of teaching session that Jesus is going to teach us in chapter 7. These kind of doctrinal things are, are things that Jesus wants the people to know. But in this section of ending in chapter 4 and through verses 5 and 6, or chapter six, 5 and 6, what we've been looking at is really been focusing on this authority in which Jesus has. This authority this as being the Messiah, as being the Son of God that he has, that he hasn't shown in, in some cases that disciples have not seen to this point. And the first scene that we come to is that, that calming of the storm whenever Jesus had been teaching there all day in chapter 4. And he gets into a boat, and he's traveling across the sea. So this is kind of like one of those first boat scenes. And he's traveling across the sea, and there's this great wind, this great storm that comes up. And the disciples come to Jesus in this, this panic and this haste, you know, and, and almost question Jesus' care for them. Do you, do you not care that we perish? Do you not care that we're about to drown here? And Jesus, in, 
I guess only Jesus fashion and his calmness and, and cool and collectiveness whenever water's flooding the boat and, you know, the disciples, to, the, the, the disciples are all frantic men sitting there screaming and, and hollering or whatever. And he calms the storm just by simple words. And though Jesus had done many miracles up to this point, he has healed, he has cast out demons, this miracle seems to capture the people or capture the disciples in a different way because they stand in amazement of him and even ask this question in verse 41, who then is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? And really, if you want to say this, you can say this. You can really almost say that this is the question that Mark is posing throughout his entire gospel. Who exactly is this man? Who is this guy? And really, he, he he's building up this theme. He's kind of He's kind of being a great writer here that he's building up this theme. Who, who is this man? And he's not giving us the answer immediately. He's not just coming out and just saying this is who he is. It's almost like, it, well, let me give you this piece of it. Let me give you this piece of it. Let me give you this piece of it. And I want to build this case to answer this question and come to this climactic conclusion in, in Mark chapter 15 when that centurion guard looks at him on the cross and said, truly, this man is the son of God. That is the answer to the question. That is, the, that is what he is leading us to, getting to the cross as quickly as he can to answer this question. Who is this man? This man truly is the son of God. And the disciples are seeing this amazement here and they're, they're seeing this, this other side of Jesus who has this authority over nature, authority over the seas. And then as they, they get to the other side, as they're leaving likely the area of Capernaum in chapter 4, and they're crossing over, and they come to the land, uh, the country of the Gerasenes, uh, they come to this Gentile country, which is on the other side of the sea. And they come there, and immediately they're, they're encountered with a man with a legion of demons. And we talked about this, and like I said, this is all review, but I, I felt like with so much information, I want to make sure we got to Sometimes, you know, looking at each individual tree, as I say, you kind of miss the forest, and and we don't want to we don't want to miss what is playing out here in this pat in this gospel. But this man runs to Jesus, falls down before his feet, and as we talked about, I don't think he was coming there to worship him. I think he was coming there to antagonize Jesus, as the demon had antagonized all people. But recognizing that it is Jesus, had no other choice but to fall down at his creator. And Jesus cast this demon out. He tells the demon he must leave. But, but it's unusual here, this conversation, because, or this actual encounter with a demon, because we see a conversation between Jesus and the demon. Most of the time, the demon just says, we know who you are, and it kind of leaves. But this gives us more insight. It gives us his name. It tells us that it's not just one demon, but it's a legion of demons. And, and what Mark is saying here is it doesn't matter whether it's one demon or, or 10,000 demons. There are no comparison to the authority in which Jesus Christ has as being the Son of God. They all must fall in submission to him. He has this authority that he's over to overcome the, the forces of nature, that the winds and the seas must obey him. But not only that, so must the legion of demons must obey him. He has his authority. And once again, the question is being posed here, who exactly is this man that even legions of demons must listen to him, must flee from him at the sound of his voice? He allows them to go into the to the to the swine because they were asking for it. The only reason they were able to go into the swine because it says that he gave them permission to do so. They were still under his authority. And yet the people seeing this take place, as we discussed, seeing this take place, and seeing this man who was a demon-possessed man who ran rampant and caused chaos and was a menace to the society there, sitting there when they came back in his right mind. Uh, and fully clothed, they were afraid and they begged Jesus to leave. They begged him. And so Jesus and his disciples get back in their boat and they cross back over to the other side. And they come back into the area probably once again of Capernaum. And they're met with a, a man, or a great crowd rather. And within that great crowd was a man named Jairus, who is a, a prominent man. 
He's the ruler of the synagogue. And we talked about how we actually know his name. And we have no other miracle up to this point that we know the name of the person who the miracle is going to take place to. But yet we know this man by name. It shows his, his prestige. It shows his status in the community that people know who he is. And he has a problem. My daughter, she's 12 years old and, and she's sick to the point of death. She's dying. Will you come to my house? And Jesus says, yes, I'll, I'll come. And in the midst of that, we know that there's this woman who had this issue of blood for 12 years who's a nobody. Nobody knows her name. She's an outcast. And she touches, she, 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 she's bent on touching Jesus' garment, that if I can just touch him, you notice that back in that, that, that summary statement of, of chapter three, it says that they were seeking to touch Jesus. In this summary statement we're going to get to, it says that they're seeking just to touch the hem of his garment or touch his garment to be healed. And she was thinking the same thing. If I can just touch him, if I can just get close to him, I know that he will be able to heal my sickness. And she did. She got there. She touched him. In the midst of this crowd, this crowd thronging on Jesus, Jesus says, whoa, stop. Somebody has touched me. And the crowd and the disciples look at him like, Jesus, you've got to be kidding me, right? Everybody is touching you right now, okay? Who hasn't touched you is the, probably the better question. But Jesus is like, no. Now, there's people touching me, but this woman, this woman has had an encounter has, has touched me differently. And Jesus pursuing this lady, making this lady come out, she comes out and she says, no, yeah, I, I touched you. I'm the one. And probably thinking in her mind, she's going to be stoned to death or she's going to be ridiculed because of the religious rituals of her being unclean. But Jesus calls her daughter. This, this term of infection, uh, of affection. And he says, your, your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. And, and what it shows to us is, is that this, this, this man who we're trying to figure out who he is, who has the authority to, to calm the winds and the seas, who has the authority and the power to, to cast out legions of demons, who has the power and authority that at a touch, a woman's illness that nobody else could, could solve, or nobody else could heal, was, was fixed in an instant. And yet that huge God has a compassion for a nobody woman that nobody, wanted, nobody knew her name and nobody wanted to be around her because of her uncleanness. It, it, it shows... Um, I've uh, been doing a, a Bible study with uh, the with an individual, and we've been uh, going through the book of John. Um, that's where they wanted to, to start at, and we've been talking about just that first chapter. It's been taking us weeks to get through just the first 18 verses of it. But it, it's like I was telling them, you know, if you look at the book of John, the first, like, five verses is like this kind of heavenly realm. You know, beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It's talking about this kind of eternal existence of, of Jesus Christ. But what Mark, what John is really trying to get to is that verse 14 where it says, and then the word became flesh. And that's what Mark is. It's, it's almost like he goes in the first five verses of this, this kind of eternal heavenly realm or where God dwells, where there is no beginning and, and no ending of him. And then he kind of slowly starts to creep and says, you know what? The world, the word, this eternal person is starting to come into our world. This transcendent God who was outside of his creation, who created all things, who was above it, a transcendent. Now this God is coming into this world in which he created that was created by his hands as John says, and this word that is eternal, that is God, is coming into this world, not just to be into the world, but, to, but he came like one of us. He came in the flesh to be one of us, that he could redeem us and save us and show the compassion and the love that God has for his creation. This is what it shows here with this woman, that this woman was a lowly woman who would be considered nobody in society, but yet Jesus stopped and he conversated with her and healed her and saved her. And in the midst of that, Jesus, or Jairus, gets the 
word that his daughter had died and saying, do not bother the teacher any longer. But yet Jesus continued to pursue to the house. And then this man who we're trying to figure out who exactly is this man grabs this little girl by the hand, tells her to arise, and death is immediately gone as quick as the demons are from the demon-possessed man. As quick as the, as the disease that had touched a woman with the issue of blood, as quickly as those diseases left is as quickly as death left without the speaking of Jesus. What we're seeing here is we're seeing this man with this, this, this great authority that the winds must have listened, the legion of demons must listen, that diseases are, are dried up in an instant at his touch, and that he can speak and death leaves and life comes into existence. And, and really, if we know who this guy is and, and know who Jesus is, we shouldn't be surprised at it because all life came into existence because of his speech. And then after he uh, heals this, uh, brings this girl back to life, we kind of see Jesus go into his, his town of Nazareth. We see him rejected by his own people. Um, we see that even in the, the miraculous that he does, that unbelief still exists. Um, we see the sending out of the disciples that we talked about, how he sent them out to, to continue the work that he was doing. He gives us kind of this, this insert of, of what happened to John the Baptist because we ain't heard back from him since back in chapter 1, I think it's verse 14, where it says, and, and John was arrested and we ain't heard anything else about John. And then we see John here and we see the beheading and the death of John. And then, then Mark returns us back to kind of this present scene of, of the disciples coming back to Jesus. Now they're still over here in this kind of region of Capernaum. And Jesus is telling the disciples, man, we need to go rest. Y'all need to go rest. Y'all been out here for however long ministering and they go across to, to go to, uh, to the sea here and um, they get in a boat or to go to a desolate place rather and they're met with this multitude of people. And Jesus having compassion on the people because he said that they're like sheep without a shepherd and he has compassion on them because the people, the religious leaders that should have been leading these people were not leading these people. They were not properly teaching them the word of God. They were adding their own religions. They were adding their own doctrines, their own traditions to God's word. And so Jesus taught them all day long. And then the disciples come up and say, well, Jesus, it's getting late out here. We need to send these boys back and these ladies back home and, and let them get them something to eat. And Jesus looks at them and says, no, you feed them. And instead of looking at this through the eyes of a spiritual mind and knowing who they are talking to, they begin to look at it through the earthly lenses and say, God, this is impossible. Not even 200 denarii, not even half a year's worth of wages of enough bread could afford to feed these people, will be enough to feed these people. And Jesus is like, well, what do we have? Well, Lord, we found five loaves and two fish. And Jesus commands them to sit down, calls the people to sit down. And he blesses the bread and he begins to break it. And I told y'all that there was some language that was used there of, of them sitting at a banquet. They were laying there in a leisurely fashion. This wasn't something chaotic. This wasn't something that was just kind of thrown together, even though it was thrown together. No, these people were sitting there. They were 
they were sitting there in groups of 50s and hundreds. They were, they were sitting in, in a community, so to speak, and they were sitting there leisurely, sitting back. They had just heard God speak to them through Jesus Christ, speaking the gospel, speaking the words. And now the disciples are coming by and giving them as much bread and as much fish as they want to eat. The Bible says, and it's amazing that it's just this little phrase that it says they ate and they were all satisfied. And that's so amazing. I know we could skip right over it, but what it means is, is that, that they had more than enough out of five loaves and two fish. Jesus gave them more than enough. And there's this, this picture, and we talked about this. Some scholars see this picture, and, and a lot of scholars actually kind of refer to this as being this kind of imagery of this kind of the, the messianic banquet of the end times when, when all of God's children would gather together and fellowship together and, and break bread together and, and be there in the presence of God. And, and the miracle ends with the disciples picking up 12 baskets full of bread and fish, more than what they even started off with. And once again, we're seeing this authority of Jesus that he can take just the bare minimal. And I don't know, like I said, I don't know whether he just broke it and just it just kept on coming or whether he was creating bread as he just spoke it. I, I, I don't know. But either way, the Bible tells us that 5,000 men, one of the other gospel writers said, not including women and children, all of them were fed and all of them were satisfied. And I don't know about you, I'm one man and I know I like to eat a lot because it takes a lot to fill me up. So I can imagine 5,000 men, there had to be a lot of bread and fish. But they ate and they were satisfied. And, and Jesus had the authority to do that, to provide for them. And you know what? He, he has the authority to provide for us in, in our needs. And you know, oftentimes we look at this provision in the physical sense that God will provide the, the funds or God will provide the meal or the whatever. But you know what? God has the means to provide us the, the spiritual insight, the spiritual wisdom, the spiritual understanding of, of his word and the things that we need and the things of Christ, in the times of crisis in our life and the times of struggle in our life. It's amazing how oftentimes you're confronted with something, good or bad, you know, and it just seems like God has provided with you, provided you with insight or, or something that you've studied or read and, and just the opportune times. It seems like, God, I've never thought about that in years, but all of a sudden, God provides that, that memory load back there, way back in the back of your brain, and he brings it to your, to your mind, and he gives it to you to give to someone else to help them, to provide for them. It's taking that five loaves, and it's breaking, it's multiplying it, and feeding the people that are and then last time, as the disciples left there, it says they, they got in a boat and Jesus made them get in a boat without him. And we talked about it's likely, and some have written that it's likely the reason why that Jesus did this was because in, in John's gospel, it says that they were pressing, the crowd was pressing to make Jesus their king. Remember, there's still this messianic expectation that the Messiah is going to come and break the rule of Rome and establish the nation for Israel as a royal king, as David and Solomon was. And maybe the reason why Jesus is because the language that is used here in our, in, where it says that he immediately made is that a force. He compelled them or constrained them. He, he forced them to leave. And it's almost a sense of urgency is what some scholars believe. And what it is, they believe that maybe he didn't want the disciples to get confused or make this situation worse with them desiring for him to be king. So he's rushing them off. Hey, y'all leave, get out of here. I'll handle the crowd. And he dismisses the crowd. And the Bible says that he goes up into a mountain to pray by himself. And we've seen how Jesus spends, has had several instances where he goes off by himself to pray. And normally when he does, the, the disciples normally get in a mess and trouble. And that's what happens here. Um, very similar to us whenever we get away from... <laughs> From those things, we end up, we find ourselves in a mess. But anyway, the disciples were struggling to, to get across the sea. It says they were going to Bethsaida, which is if, if the Capernaum area, so if you're looking at the Sea of Galilee, so Capernaum and the area where they were in is, is kind of on the, the western side. Um, 
Becerra is is on the kind of the the eastern northern tip of the Sea of Galilee, so that's where they were headed to. But whenever uh, the wind came, they could not make it across, and Jesus comes walking on the water. Once again, defying the odds, defying nature, having the authority to overcome this. And we talked about how last week it says that they were, he was going to pass by them. And we talked about that language wasn't necessarily meaning that Jesus was going to just walk by and just not take care of the disciples. But there's this language that is used of that of Exodus whenever God was going to pass by Moses. And that passing by is a revealing of who God is. It's this revelation of God. It's, he's saying, that, as he told Moses, I'm going to pass by you and you can see me from the backside. You can see me pass by, but you cannot see my face. It's this kind of revealing revelation of God. We've seen that also in, I think it's in, it's in First Kings. We also saw that uh, where Elijah, I think it's in chapter 19, where Elijah had just had that great mountain experience where he killed all the, where all the, the gods of, uh, the prophets of Baal were consumed by the fire. And then he runs off and goes, has a pity party and says, God, nobody's here to help me. You know, I'm the only one here and, and they're out to kill me. And then it says that God passed by, but he wasn't in the whirlwind or he wasn't in the this or that, but what was he in? He was in the, the small whisper, the, the still voice. As God was passing by, he was revealing himself to Elijah. And this passing by the disciples was God, was Jesus revealing himself. If he wanted to pass by, we read Job chapter 9. If you remember Job chapter 9, it says that, that he, he walks or he passes by, but he is not seen. He is not visible for us to see. In other words, if God wants to move by us and not be seen, he is invisible is what Paul tells us. He's the invisible God. It's what the Bible teaches us. When God is shown, when God makes himself shown, makes him or we see God or see anything about God, or we see any revelation of God, it is because God has desire to make himself known to us. And that's what he did with the disciples here. And they being terrified, thought it was a ghost, and Jesus got into the boat, told them who it was, got into the boat, told them not to be afraid, and he calls the wind to cease. And at the in the verse 51 and verse 52, it says, and they were utterly astonished. That's the disciples. And they did not understand because uh, for they did not understand about the loaves for their hearts were hard. And we talked about how this becomes really this transitioning into talking about how the disciples being, if you remember back in chapter three, being that inner group, yet they still are hardening their hearts not to fully see and understand who Jesus is. And they didn't understand the miraculous of what Jesus did. For whatever reason, that, 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 that feeding of the 5,000, as we talked about, was, was kind of that point in which Jesus said, you should know by now, by all the things that you've seen, especially seeing that miracle, you should know by now who I am and what I'm capable of doing. And yet the disciples still did not know. They still were astonished at Jesus. And Jesus is saying, it's because of your unbelief. It's because you're hardened of heart. And then we come to this passage and it says, and when they had crossed over, they came to the land of the, uh, of the uh, Genesaret uh, and moored at the shore. Now, I'm just going to mention this to you because there is, if, if you do a study in this, there is some kind of um, disparity there. Now, like I said, Bethsaida is on the northern eastern tip of, um, of the Sea of Galilee. Um, Genesaret is actually on the western side, just south of Capernaum. So if they were crossing over the sea to get to Bethsaida, but yet they landed in Genesaret, which is the opposite direction. So there's kind of a conflict there. And, and there's, there's a few different stories or a few different um, ways that has been explained. One is simply that the disciples, it says they got in a strong wind and they were not able, they were struggling to get across the sea. And it's likely that the wind was pushing them back down towards Genesaret. Genesaret. And so when Jesus got in the boat, they just headed back to Genesaret. One um, scholar, which I've read, he 
gave it this way. He said that the disciples went to Bethsaida and since Jesus was in the mountains praying and he took longer praying that they decided to come back across the sea to Jesus. And in that time period is whenever they encountered the great storm and Jesus met them in the sea and came back there. But that would kind of somewhat explain one of those two instances is what seems to be the most uh, popular would explain why they were going to one direction but ended up in another direction. And they get here and they anchor to the shore and when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. And once again, this shows the popularity of Jesus and it says, and ran about the whole region beginning to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. Now, this is, you have to understand that this would have been a, a, a very odd scene. I mean, we're talking about men and women, full grown men and women, who are on beds, sick, and these people are just carrying them around everywhere, from region to region, wherever they're hearing Jesus is at, they're, they're grabbing them and they're, they're bringing them to this man. They're, 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 they've heard so much about Jesus. You have to understand the popularity of Jesus that we're not just talking about there in one town of Capernaum, which is you know possibly 10,000 people. We're talking about a whole region, a whole area that has, we have to get out of our mindset of where we are today. We're not talking about cars. We're not talking about internet. We're not talking about cell phones. We're not talking about any technology. And you talk about the popularity of Jesus. You talk about, uh, I remember taking marketing classes in, in college and the best and freest form of marketing is what? Word of mouth. I go somewhere, I like it, and I go tell five of my friends, hey man, this place is great, you need to go try it. They go try it, they go tell five other people. Uh, so what do you, it's just multiplying effect. I go to a place and it's terrible and I go tell five friends that it's terrible. Guess what? They're going to go and, well, I'm not going to that place. And they're going to tell five friends, I, I've heard it's terrible. You don't want to go to that place. But they've been hearing about Jesus and his, and his popularity is that people are just looking for him. I almost was, would think they were anticipating, waiting for when, when is he going to pass through our area? This man's traveling all over. And when they're hearing about it, it, it says they, they, they ran about the whole region beginning to bring the sick people to wherever they heard he was. Hey, man, I heard he's down in Patrick. Let's, let's get down there to Patrick. Hurry. We, we got to go before he leaves. Man, he's in Chesterfield. We got to get to Chesterfield. And, and, and imagine some of these areas would be like us taking someone on a bed and start walking to Patrick down Highway 9. It's like, we got to get to Jesus before he leaves. He's at Mr. Frankie's store. We, he's got him held hostage. They so won't leave us. But this is, I mean, this is, this is the chaos that was. And listen to what it goes on to say in verse 56. And it says, and, and wherever he came in villages, cities, or countrysides, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garments. And as many as touched him or touched it were made whole or made well. Wherever he came. Villages, cities, countryside. And imagine that, that they would just, I mean, here's this man just, just walking throughout, teaching and, and preaching. And it's, and it's, it's, it's interesting that he, he does not mention teaching in this, but this is not to imply that he was not teaching. Because Jesus, as I've told you before, is more of a teacher than he is a miracle worker. He did a lot of miracles, but he's more so known for his teaching than he is his miracles. You never hear him come up and say, hey, miracle worker, what do they call it? Rabbi or teacher. But they, they would come to him and, and, and Jesus would be walking on the street or, or there in the marketplace and, and they would just come and they would just lay a sick person there at his feet. And you can imagine the illnesses that were going on at that time. I mean, we, we, are, we have a lot of illnesses, but we're blessed with the technology that we have and the medications that we have and the, and the medical systems that we have that a lot of people aren't just like deathly sick walking down the streets. But these people were being drugged out of their, dragged out of their houses and, and just laid at the feet of Jesus in the middle of everywhere, just desiring if they could just 
just let us touch you, Jesus, that, that, that we can be made whole. And, 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 and what I want you to gather, and maybe what Mark is wanting us to gather from this too, is that how accessible that Jesus made himself to the people. How accessible he made himself to the people. You know what? Jesus did not go hide in a, in a cliff somewhere. He didn't go hide in a house somewhere. If anybody wanted to find Jesus, they knew exactly. where they, It wouldn't be hard to find where he's at. And just follow the crowd. <laughs> They'll lead you straight to them. But they would lay people at his feet in marketplaces, wherever, and just beg him that he that they may touch him. And, and at the end of verse 56, and it says, as many as touched his garment, meaning touched the fringe of his garment, were made well. Now, I want to remind you, because this reminds us of what took place with the woman with the issue of blood, that she touched his garment. And I want you to remind you what we talked about whenever she touched his garment, that he wanted her to realize that it wasn't the touching of the garment that made her well. It was the faith or faith that made her well. It was her faith in believing that Jesus Christ was able to do this. It wasn't like this was some kind of ritual or some kind of magical cloak that he had on that you could just, that it was just touching it's the idea that they believed that Jesus had the power to do so, and they were stepping out and doing that by touching his garments to make him well. But Jesus made himself available to be able to be touched. And the, and the same is so true with us today. God has made himself so available to us. And people often ask, well, you know, Brad, how's God available to me? Man, we have this right here. In more forms than anybody has ever had in the creation of this world, meaning the word of God, to be a, that God has made himself accessible to us. We have more knowledge about God's word than probably ever any creation. And yet we are probably less of a, of a, of, of a godly people with more access to God and more access to knowing his word than any other country probably has ever had. And yet we're probably the most godless and paganist is a society that has, I want to say, probably ever lived on the face of this earth, but probably very close. <clears throat> and God is very accessible to us. Very accessible. But it, it kind of goes back to what that, that book that I was reading kind of discusses. God has made himself so accessible to us and so available to us, but yet we have become so busy that we're not, we don't have enough time for God. We don't have enough time to, um, to, to be as these people and go seek out Jesus. I mean, these people were giving up their days to travel to go where Jesus was at. They were giving up their livelihood for that moment of time to go and see where Jesus was at. They were giving up their, their time of pleasure, their time of leisure to go and hear Jesus, to, to see Jesus, to touch Jesus. And as we were talking about in our time before we, we started here tonight about that community of, of helping the widows and helping the orphans and helping those who are sick. These people were a community that they were dragging the people who were sick out of their houses and getting them to the feet of Jesus to be healed. They were bringing people who were, who were afflicted. They were bringing people who were sick. They were bringing people who were ill. They were bringing these people to the one person they knew that could make them whole, and it was Jesus. They were giving up all this to get to him. And yet he is so readily and so accessible to us, more so than what, because he was just in a physical form at that time. You had to go where he was at. And now he's given us the word of God and it's a copy of the word of God that gives us and the Holy Spirit to be able to understand this word and be revealed this word through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given us access through prayer. And yet we are just too busy. We're too preoccupied. To, to reach out 
and seek this God that has made himself available to us and accessible to us. And so Mark is kind of closing this section out of, of this summary. And this is kind of what I want us to gather from this, is that this, this God, kind of going back to what I said about John, who was eternal, who, can, who has spoken the world into existence, who has the authority to speak and the winds and the seas obey, who has the authority to speak and the demons must listen, who has the authority to, to touch and to speak and the death must leave and life must come, the one who can feed 5,000 with just the, the breaking of five loaves and some fish, who can walk on water, who can cease and cause the wind to cease, who can touch and heal diseases with the touch of his garment. That God of power and, and majesty and strength and sovereignty came into our world in flesh to dwell with us. And as Paul writes in that 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 famous, what most believe to be a hymn in Philippians chapter 2, that he lowered himself, taking on the form of a servant. And he humbled himself even to the point of death. God came into the world that he created and became flesh that he could save the world that he created because sin and because of man's fall. And regardless of what people want to believe about this, that, and the other in religion and theology, and one thing we do know out of the mysteries of God that we do not know, the one thing we do know is, is that God loves his people and loves his creation because if he did not, he would have never came. He would have never, he would have never embarked into the, 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 the world of time and space and clued himself into the pain and the sufferings in which we face if it wasn't for his love for us. And Mark is, is demonstrating this God who has made himself flesh, this God who has made himself one of us, who is demonstrating that he is God by his miraculous power. And that we're awed by the, by the miracles that he's doing, and we should be. But we should not miss the small emphasis of that God came to be personal with us. The one who can do all those things <clears throat> made himself available and accessible to us. And Jesus is going around and he's, he's doing these things. And when we open up next, next time, Jesus goes into another session of teaching. And we'll see this as he's being confronted with the Pharisees once again. Father, we were grateful God, you have made yourself accessible to us, God. With the presence of your Holy Spirit, through, through your word, through, through prayer. And God, we, we all fall short. We all lack. We all miss those opportunities of, of desiring you. We get so sidetracked, God. We, we are all guilty. And I, I speak as one of the, the most guilty, God. <clears throat> But Lord, you're, you're, you're so accessible, but God, you're so patient as well. Um, and God, just to, as, as Paul says in his word, there's a passing wealth of knowing who you are. There's nothing more valuable to us as Christian people 
and knowing you. And God, having this, this precious word to be able to, to, to seek you and to get to know you more and more. And Father, I pray that God, we would, we would realize that and we would, we would be as, as these people who would just traveling wherever you were to get to you, that God, we would seek you in whatever means, whatever way, whatever it means for us to give up to, to seek you. And God, if it means not only us giving up things, but Lord, also us being there available to drag people if we need to, to you as well. So Father, give us the strength and the endurance to continue to persevere, continue to seek you. And God, we give you praise. In Jesus' name.